Good afternoon and welcome to today's discussion of procurement. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jim Kozich. I'm the uh, supervisor for the research procurement team in procurement services. And uh, again, thank you for joining. Please direct any questions to the chat and I'll try to address those as we go and we'll have some time for questions at the end as well. So today we're going to start with a, a broad introduction to procurement at U of M. We're gonna talk about the competitive bid process, the role that uniform guidance has to play as well as non-competitive purchases or sole sourced purchases, some basics about the contracting process, and a quick overview of the procurement services website and the resources available to you. So a brief introduction to procurement. We support all three campuses of the university as well as Michigan Medicine. Uh, we're responsible for the acquisition, use, and disposal of nearly $3 billion of goods and services annually. Uh, we assist units in the purchase of a wide variety of items. Um, we are not the end users, so we are here to help facilitate uh, PIs and other stakeholders purchase of the items that they need. And we also develop contracts uh, that the university can take advantage of as a whole. Um, to allow us better discounting and better terms uh, and a streamlined process, regardless of the value. Our primary value that we bring, in addition to cost savings, is we are here to mitigate legal, financial, compliance, uh, risks, liabilities, et cetera, while ensuring an ethical, transparent, and competitive process is adhered to uh, when expending funds. And we also support uh, the university in making sure that all the various regulations, both uh, local, state, uh, federal, are followed um, as required. Procurement also has signing authority for any university contracts. The signature authority is passed down from the regents. As a participant in the procurement process, departments are accountable for the purchases you make. Let's start with some of the department responsibilities for purchasing. In general, faculty and staff are authorized to complete transactions totaling less than $10,000. All the usual policies must be followed, but essentially you are running your own procurement uh, under $10,000, provided that nothing needs to be signed or uh, we're not looking at a long-term contract. The regents require that all transactions $10,000 or greater be competitively bid and that this process is managed by procurement services to ensure a fair and reasonable and open competitive marketplace. The $10,000 limit applies not just to a single payment, but to the entire life of the engagement. So if you are making multiple payments over a period of time that add up to more than $10,000, procurement will need to be contacted. Uh, incidentally, $10,000 is also the federal micro-purchase threshold. Um, we had a question, what do you consider a long-term commitment uh, it is related to contracts? If we're doing multiple payments over a period of time, uh, anything that's not uh, a single payment or a single engagement. Uh, so when working with procurement services, there's a few things that the department is responsible for and needs to do to help us out. Um, first, and you'll hear this a number of times during the presentation, is contact procurement early in the process. I cannot, I can't stress that enough, that it that will help everyone involved and ensure a better and smoother process for you and your PIs. Um, we will need a scope of work or a set of specifications. Uh, and the more detailed, the better. Um, we'd also ask you to identify some potential suppliers. Uh, we can help find more suppliers, but if, if you have a few already in mind and their contact information, that would be very helpful. Also a general idea of the timeline that you're looking at, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the process timeline, but keep in mind that whatever timeline you establish has to be reasonable. Uh, which which goes back to 
contacting us early. And also some idea of the valuation criteria you're looking for. Um, you know, if you if you're reviewing multiple bids, uh, is price the most determined uh, the most important factor, or is it value, or are there certain technical specifications you're looking for? Things like that. Um, there's a link there to the SPG, which details the responsibilities required of both the unit and procurement services. So let's talk a little bit about some of the different buying methods we have. Uh, we have a range of, of them, uh, depending on the circumstances. Um, we're going to go into uh, each of these sort of on the left-hand side there in just a moment. But I do want to point out that link at the bottom to the Buying at U of M Quick Start Guide. That is a, a fantastic high-level resource, and I would encourage you all to download that and take a look at that after the presentation. So our, our first sort of buying method, if you want to call it that, would be to utilize internal service providers. Um, these are U of M business units that provide goods or services to other units. Procurement does not need to be involved. There does not need to be a competitive bid. You can use your short code. Um, and there are a range of, of goods and services available, everything from catering to moving to scientific services, DNA sequencing, microscopy. Uh, the university even has a custom glass blowing shop for your custom lab glassware needs. The next would be strategic contracts or university contracts. These are suppliers for which procurement has established a university-wide agreement uh, that can be uh, used by anyone, uh, all authorized faculty and staff. Many of these, although not all of them, are found in our M Market Site. M Market Site is our uh, Jager platform where we host uh, catalogs for a number of our suppliers. And you can punch out an order directly from their catalog at prices that we've negotiated, uh, often with um, additional items like free shipping and better customer service support. We also have uh, our quote to order system. Um, you'll see there's three different commodities that we focused on there, printing and mail, website and graphic design, and IT temp staffing. We've established contracts with suppliers that provide these items. And the QTO system allows a, a quick and easy way for faculty and staff to obtain estimates from multiple suppliers and then choose who to award from among our contracted suppliers. And then finally, we come to the EPRO requisition. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. That is our M Pathways uh, uh, purchase order system. So for anything that is not a, a market site order or an internal service provider, um, the way that we interact with the suppliers is through purchase orders. Um, they're used for one-time purchases where we don't have contracts in place, or if procurement has established a contract for you for a specific project, and you're looking to make uh, a payment in a series of payments, you would also enter uh, a requisition in Pathways um, referencing that contract number and it becomes a contract release. Contract leases don't require any additional review from procurement um, because we've already uh, processed the contract for you. Um, and we'll also talk about people pay requisitions, uh, used to pay individuals, um, could be honorarium or uh, uh, some travel costs or, or something like that. And finally, the P-Card. The P-Card is primarily intended for business travel and hosting, although on occasion, it can be used for other types of low dollar supply type items. If you have a business need to buy something larger or in a, in a category that is not normally allowed by either procurement or your unit, you can contact procurement services to have a buyer review the situation and if appropriate, we will issue an approval for you to use your P-card or, or assist you in finding uh, uh, another method. So that's some of the basics. Now let's talk about the competitive bid process or, or just orders 10K and over. So the University of Michigan 
has set its bid limit at $10,000. Additionally, the federal government has set the what they call the micro purchase threshold at $10,000. So university and the federal government are aligned on that. The expectation is that all purchases of goods and services over $10,000 will be competitively bid. Uh, and that the, the bid process will be handled by procurement to ensure we comply with all the various rules and regulations and uh, we have an open and competitive marketplace. Contact procurement early. So as soon as you have the funding uh, for a piece of equipment, let us know. Um, one of the more frustrating things that we come across is we will hear from PIs that have spent months or even years negotiating or investigating uh, a particular piece of equipment. And then right before a grant deadline, they decide they want to buy it. Contact us early in the process. We can help identify suppliers. We can help run the, the we can run the bid process. We can uh, facilitate walkthroughs, demos, uh, testing samples. We can do a lot of the legwork that some of the PIs are doing now and uh, take that burden off the PIs and do it in a way that ensures we're following all our processes and ultimately speeds up the process for the labs. Um, to help us with that, we want as much detailed information as possible about your requirements. The more detailed and more technical, the better. Uh, that will cut down on questions back and forth with suppliers. And understand that it's going to take uh, some time. I uh, got a question. Can you give us a timeline for the bid process and what is reviewed in making a decision? Uh, let's see. So oh, we'll move to the next slide. The, the bid process really varies depending on the situation, um, but expect it to take somewhere between two and four weeks for suppliers to respond. Uh, for some of the more simple, uh, straightforward orders, we can actually move much quicker. But as the complexity and the dollar value goes up, obviously the timelines uh, extend as well. Um, other factors that, go, that come into play are getting all the information from the department and establishing what the specs are. Um, and then uh, if there's any questions back and forth between the, the supplier and the department, uh, legal negotiations over the contract, uh, uh, departments taking time to decide which supplier to award. So it, it can really vary, but uh, expect two to four weeks uh, at, uh, on average. And again, as the complexity and dollar value goes up, it could be could be longer. Um, we so I think a common misconception is that procurement will do a competitive bid and compel a PI or department to choose the low bid, and that's just not true. We will never force a PI to buy something that they don't want or can't use. The lab will make the selection, and you are not required to choose the low bid, provided there's a reasonable technical or business justification. You're required to choose the best value. So if you can make a reasonable case that spending a little extra money gives you additional research capability or, or otherwise makes sense for your lab, then uh, we will document that appropriately. Um, once an award is made, uh, by and large departments will manage the relationship with that supplier. Um, procurement can assist in that if there are any contract questions or there's a dispute, but by and large, the, the, the relationship there is between the lab and the supplier once an award has been made. While I should say, while the competitive bid of bidding process is happening, all communication must go through procurement. Uh, that's that's uh, because everything is audited subject to FOIA. And, uh, and again, it goes back to creating a, a fair and competitive environment. Let's see, there's another question. Our PIs typically do their own vetting and review of different vendors as they are the ones who are the content experts. Uh, yes, um, so that is that is fine. Is there a guide as to what kind of So when procurement uh, 
performs a competitive bid, we will compile all the information, uh, both the business and technical, everything about the, the warranty, shipping timeframes, um, and anything else that the supplier send us. And we will basically put together a package to send to uh, your department for the PI to review the available options. And if the PI has additional questions, we can help go back to the supplier and get answers for all those. So the PI is still doing the reviewing and choosing of uh, the appropriate supplier. Um, and you can work with your, uh, your buyer to determine uh, the documentation and any, um, any evaluation criteria. So that, will, that will vary depending on the situation. So again, a few uh, things that will impact the bid timeline. Um, actually, one of the bigger ones is the project team availability, especially when we're looking at large scale RFPs. Uh, so if you have a team of people in your department that has to review uh, bids to select a supplier, we recommend blocking out some time uh, so that the, the buyer will schedule uh, when the bid will take place. And then we recommend the department blocks out specific time after that to review the bid choices. Um, the scope, uh, again, if, we're, if, if it's a straightforward buy of a single piece of equipment, that can go very quickly. Um, you know, a matter of, of hours to days, whereas if we're doing a, an RFP for a large impact solution across campus, that could take much longer. Um, the suppliers need adequate time to develop a response. Uh, the department needs to decide on their evaluation criteria. And then the other big one is terms and conditions. Um, if, if we've not worked with a supplier before or we're in a dispute over terms, um, that can take a while, uh, especially if we need to go back to uh, uh, the Office of General Counsel for legal advice. And there might be some back and forth and redlining there. Okay, so now let's talk about what happens when we're not doing a competitive bid? So a, a non-competitive purchase. Um, so this is any purchase of goods or services that has not been subjected to an open solicitation for pricing from multiple suppliers, uh, or that has not been evaluated by, by procurement services. Um, so we would also call these sole sourced purchases and they're allowed only under exceptional and limited circumstances. Admittedly in the research commodity, uh, we buy a lot of um, technology that is at the absolute cutting edge and is proprietary to specific companies because they've come up with uh, uh, you know new patents or new ideas, um, and they are the only ones that have that available technology. Procurement services is, is the uh, will determine whether a purchase can be competitively bid or if it qualifies to be exempt from the bid process, if we can allow a sole source. So we require that departments complete a sole source justification form, and we'll take a look at that in just a moment. And we're looking for departments to make the case that the non-competitive purchase is in the best interest of the university by answering the questions on that form. Completing a form does not guarantee that we will approve a sole source uh, request. Uh, and the purchase does get reported to the regions. All sorts of sole source purchases get reported to the regions. And a quick note, there, there is a, a reference to a sole source justification in the e-research system, um, which has to do with, uh, I believe, OCA and subcontracts and whatnot. This is not the same as the procurement services sole source justification. Uh, they have some similarities, but um, the, uh, the sole source justification for procurement cannot be found in the e-research system. So I just want to um, clear that up. Uh, and again, we're going to get to the sole source form in just a moment and talk more about that. But I do want to make a few notes about the, well, now 2018 changes to federal uniform guidance. Um, they changed the policy on when they allow sole source purchases. So one of the, the, the four circumstances listed below has to apply. Uh, the one we commonly see is the item is available only from a single source. And that's aligned with our expectations as well. 
Um, the public ex exigency or emergency for the requirement will not permit a delay. I can tell you that the only time that I have seen that used was related to pandemic items like COVID testing. And for a short period, the university was attempting to stand up a field hospital uh, on short notice. Um, I would not expect, at least in the research commodity, I would not expect to see that apply to really much of anything. The third one is that the federal awarding agency expressly authorizes a non-competitive proposal. Um, should you wish to pursue that route, the process is to contact ORSP and ORSP will contact the sponsor and request a non-competitive award. I can tell you from experience that almost universally the response from federal sponsors has been you must follow the competitive bid process. You're welcome to buy the widget from Acme Company in the context of a competitive bid. Uh, and then finally, uh, if we if we go out and do a bid, and let's say we only get one response, we can still move forward with that, um, provided that we have followed the process and solicited competition as best we can. And also, um, so we talked a little bit about the micro purchase threshold being ten thousand dollars under federal UG. They also have another threshold called the Simplified Acquisition Threshold. This is $250,000. And that's 250 k for any purchase, including federal funds. So even if it's uh, uh, the federal funds are only being used for part of the purchase, if the purchase itself is over 250 using federal funds, these rules apply. There are some rare exceptions, but for all intents and purposes, if you are making a purchase on federal money over $250,000, you should expect to have to competitively bid. Um, we, uh, the, we also publicize those to the public. So in addition to the suppliers we solicit, anybody can come and bid on them. Um, I think we actually do well more than 20 at this point annually. Federal, require, federal guidelines do not require you to accept the lowest bid. It's the same uh, type of idea you're required to accept the best of value. So if you don't pick the low bid, you have to be able to provide a reasonable justification. Um, uh, an, an analogy I, I like to use is, let's say that you were buying a really fancy pickup truck. I, and I know they're expensive nowadays, maybe not 250K, but let's say it was, right? And there's a $50,000 difference, but the only real difference is one truck is blue and the other one is green. Well, I mean, I like blue more than green just as much as any other good Michigan fan, but that's probably not a $50,000 reason, right? But if, if you know, the, the more expensive truck has uh, some capability directly related to your needs, then maybe there's an argument there, right? Okay, let's talk about the sole source form. I am going to switch over to that. Hopefully folks can see the sole source form. Yes, it's good, Jim. Okay, thank you. So this is this is the form that procurement is looking for. Um, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment where to find it on our website. Uh, so we start off with some basic information. Um, under estimated value, we're looking here for the total value of the engagement. So if we're doing a contract and uh, you know it's multiple payments, we're looking for the, the, the total maximum potential of the full contract over the, the full life of it. Um, so number one, describe the intended use for this product or service. Basically, what, what type of research are you doing? How is this going to um, provide data for your lab and why is that data valuable? You know, give us the, the context for why you need this particular item. Uh, number two, describe the unique features. So we're specifically looking here for unique technical features. Um, and those technical features should relate back to your intended use in question one. Um, we'll take a moment to pause here to, to say that um, price, is not a reason for a sole source. Reputation, uh, previous experience, uh, 
you know, your friend uh, down the hall uses it. These are not valid reasons for a sole source. Now, you could have a need to match existing equipment in your lab or match uh, equipment for a collaborator that has done this exact same type of work and you want the data to be comparable uh, so you can match methods exactly. Uh, that might be a, a valid reason. Um, but yeah, especially price is not a, a valid reason for a sole source. We're looking for unique technical features. Number three is, is uh, again, why do these features, uh, why are they required? So relate these technical features back to your particular research. The other side of a sole source is uh, sometimes we are told that people think that this is the easier route, but but actually much of the due diligence gets placed on the department as a result of this route. And one of those is document the process used to find this supplier. So maybe you did formed web searches, maybe you went to uh, conferences and spoke with your colleagues or different suppliers. Maybe you had site visits, uh, maybe you had demos run. Um, those are all uh, things we'd be looking for there. Number five, describe the reason for rejecting the other products. Um, again, price is not a reason for a sole source. So if the other products you investigated do not have the technical capability, that's what we're really looking for there. And then we need evidence that diligence has been done. Um, in particular, uh, we have a requirement to prove that the pricing is fair and reasonable. That can be accomplished a number of different ways. Um, if you, let's say you're trying to match existing equipment. So maybe you've got a, a copy of a purchase order or quote from when you bought this equipment a few years ago. Or you solicited uh, quotes for a few different pieces of equipment. The other ones don't meet the technical requirements, so you can't use them. But we can look at the price of those and kind of make a judgment call on, you know, if if the item we're buying is in the right ballpark, right? Because we get, again, some comparable items that maybe don't quite fulfill the requirements, but, you know, same, same ballpark. You could do some uh, web research uh, and get some screenshots of uh, web pricing. Um, you might also be able to get list pricing or a, a, a published price list from suppliers. Or if you've got the data proof of sales to others at similar prices, sometimes suppliers can provide that or if a PI is working with collaborators and they're willing to share the price they paid, that sort of thing. Number seven, is this product or service proprietary? Really what we're looking for here is a patent number. If you don't have a patent number, just put NA. And the patent should relate directly to the research that you are doing. Um, again, if I go back to the automotive analogy, cars have hundreds and hundreds of items on there that are patented. Not all of them are essential to what you may be doing. Uh, is this purchase required to match existing equipment? Um, you would describe that there. Again, if you were trying to uh, you know, expand your capacity in the lab uh, and you need to match equipment you've already got or your old equipment broke down, but you've already established data on it and you want to continue the, those same research methods um, and you need a direct replacement or you're collaborating with another PI and you need to match their methods, um, that this would be a, a place to document that. And uh, number nine, again, you know, the expectation is that items over $10,000 will be competitively bid. So I, we're really looking for uh, a statement that you sort of understand the, the policy and process and an understanding that this is an exception and not the rule. And then, of course, uh, the signature block. I will say that... Um, Pretty much all, all the procurement teams would, would offer and the buyer teams would offer before you go and get signatures on a sole source. If you think you've got a legitimate case for a sole source purchase, 
but you're not sure that you've documented it well, you're welcome to get in contact with a buyer and we can review it and suggest some edits to make sure that um, the that everything is documented appropriately uh, and actually evaluate if we if we would would approve the sole source. Uh, we do see a number of situations where we believe there is a legitimate case for a sole sourced purchase, but perhaps we're not documenting it well. And, and we can help with that before you go through the signature process so you don't have to repeat that. So I would offer that to you. Um, uh, yes, so you could you could get in contact. Uh, I'm sorry, there was a question. Are you saying you'd accept a request for pre-approval before signature? So yes, we are we are willing to review potential sole sources before you go and get the, the signatures on them. Other, other pitfalls with the sole source that we see, um, every once in a while suppliers will sort of write their own sort of a sole source document. We don't accept that. Um, we will not accept a sole source justification filled out by a supplier. Um, sometimes people try to paste in a bunch of marketing lingo. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact that an item is the market leader does not make it a sole source. And it's uh, it's very transparent when we see that kind of language in sole sources. Uh, so that those those will be rejected quickly. <laughs> so again, we're looking for unique technical justifications is really what we're getting back to. That's that's the core takeaway with a sole source. Any other questions on sole sources? No. Okay. If if you do think of some, uh, we'll have an opportunity at the end for some more questions. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about contracting. So most of, mostly for, to this point, we've talked about what we would call a spot buy, uh, you know, an individual piece of equipment or something. Um, let's talk a little bit about contracts. Contract All contracts and agreements between a supplier and the university must be reviewed by procurement services. So if there's a document that needs to be signed, procurement must review it. Um, Contracts are longer term engagements. In other words, there might be multiple payments, or even if they're not multiple payments, maybe there is a, a, a project that's happening, or um, you know, a statement of work with a number of deliverables or uh, uh, data points that have to be provided before payment is made. Um, some contracts and agreements contain language that requires review by the office's general counsel or risk management or uh, the export control office or, or a number of other uh, entities and procurement will obtain the necessary approvals from all those folks. Uh, procurement will handle the negotiation with suppliers and obtain all the signatures. So typically we will review the contract documents negotiate back and forth with a supplier. And when we think we've got something that we can live with, um, if we have any concerns, we will send those to the department in what we would call a department business decision, where we call out specific sections of a contract that we think you need to know or be aware of or make a decision on whether or not you wanna accept. And you can accept it, reject it, or say, go back and negotiate this further. This doesn't meet our expectations. And we'll go back and take another swing at it. Um, so it's the signature authority belongs to procurement services as passed down by the regents. Faculty and staff are not authorized to sign contracts and agreements on behalf of the university. Um, generally speaking, you can sign P card receipts. Uh, that's about it. Anything that would bind the university in any way has to be reviewed by procurement. Uh, we want to avoid premature commitments. So that uh, what we mean by that is you can certainly cultivate relationships with suppliers and potential partners, but you want to avoid making a commitment for a purchase or uh, or a contract. Uh, you can inform them of our competitive bidding policy, and uh, you know make it clear that others, mostly procurement, will have to review and sign any contracts. Um, don't conduct any independent negotiations. Uh, this is especially important while a bid process is running. Um, if there are side negotiations between a supplier and the department, we will go ahead and disqualify that supplier. 
if if we don't scrap the whole bid and start over. Um, again, we have to ensure a, an open and competitive environment. We are subject to audit. We are subject to FOIA. Um, so all those sort of negotiations need to run through procurement. Uh, and the other thing to consider about contracts, especially, is if you only receive what is written in the contract for the money you have agreed to pay in the contract, will you be satisfied? Handshake deals, back a napkin, verbal discussions, none of that matters. If it is not written down, it is not real. Or preferred or internal vendors. Uh, so, so for uh, we, we just got a question, are, are we able to sign for preferred or internal vendors? Um, so, if if we're talking about an internal service provider, uh, if there's anything to sign, then then yes, because they're already a part of the university. You wouldn't be binding the university with an outside entity. Um, you know, I, I I'm actually not sure about catering with Picasso. Um, if you'd like to contact me after the the session, I can get you in contact with uh, the agent who handles contract uh, catering. But I know we have a number of catering contracts. And if that's just a matter of of signing a uh, uh, you know a quote for an event or something, um, I doubt that that would be an issue. But let me know. Uh, let's see. Can we receive guidance from procurement if we don't have vendors identified? Yes, we can help. Though, as someone pointed out earlier, the PIs are the content experts, so we may have some more ideas, and we can certainly do some research. Um, we would look to the PIs to lead that. Uh, so we can can we sign for maintenance agreements for BioRed, Sigma, et cetera? So uh, the short answer is no. Um, although for some of those that are with our strategic suppliers, you shouldn't need to sign anyway. We should be able to just um, contact those suppliers with a short code. Or if, if you need to process a PO for those, we can do that too. Uh, but because we already have a contract in place with them, we shouldn't need to sign another one just for a service contract. But if someone does require a signature, again, contact procurement and uh, we can help with that. Okay, uh, contracting timeline impacts. So there's a number of impacts. One that, uh, especially the technology team seems a lot, sees a lot is the data classifications. So if you are sharing university data, or the, or the vendor will have access to university data. There are a number of processes uh, in, in place for that. One is a data protection agreement. Um, the other is uh, a review uh, by some of the security folks at uh, the university. There's a, there's a questionnaire, so that can impact the timeline. If we're dealing with protected health information, we might require a business associate agreement. Um, confidentiality concerns, there might be a non-disclosure agreement involved. Um, people sometimes want to negotiate uh, insurance requirements. There could be red lines that go back and forth with the Office of General Counsel. If there, uh, there's payment or you're collecting uh, card information, uh, the Treasury Office may need to be involved. In the research space, I'll actually add a, a couple of other ones. Uh, we deal regularly with the Export Control Office. Uh, you might think that's strange if we're not sending something to another country, but um, the way that the regulations are written, uh, even if an item never leaves the university, if it's accessed by foreign nationals, it can be deemed exported. So that's something we need to track with the Export Control Office. Um, sometimes we have to involve uh, Environmental Health and Safety, EHS, for things like lasers and biosafety cabinets, or the Animal Care and Use Office, or the uh, Human Data and Biospecimen Committee, just to name off a few. We got a question, what if we're sending biosamples out of the country for analysis? Um, so just as, as a quick sort of example, um, in this case, it would depend on what kind of samples they are. If they're human samples, uh, we may need to get the Human Data and Biospecimen Committee involved. Uh, one thing that we see in the research space is that some suppliers will offer a discount on analysis of samples if they're allowed to keep the samples afterward. Uh, and that that can 
prevent a number of issues from a um, consent piece as well as a value piece because the university spent funds to compile these samples and they have a value, uh, right? So if you're sending bio samples out of the country for analysis, um, I would encourage you to contact the research team and we can help facilitate that and take a look at the, the specific concerns there. Yeah, and, and again, it depends on what kind of samples they are and, uh, and what kind of uh, consent or data or, or some other pieces that uh, need to be reviewed there. Okay, let's talk about strategic contracts for a minute. Um, so so the, 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 the contracts that we just sort of covered are usually project specific. Uh, they apply to your department or to a particular PI. Um, but we also have broader agreements that span uh, across the whole university, some of which we consider what we would call a strategic contract. We use strategic sourcing to maximize our buying power and minimize the cost of goods and the transactional burden. Uh, in the research space, we've established contracts with some of the big names you probably know, Fisher, Sigma, Kyogen, BioRad, um, and some of the antibody suppliers and, and others. Um, the benefits of strategic contracts, we negotiate pricing on our top spend items. So there's lower costs. Uh, we, I get, yeah, we negotiate discounts on categories that maybe aren't, aren't on our top list of items. Um, we often get free or reduced shipping. And then there's uh, electronic invoice and payment processing, which saves the university quite a bit of money uh, in terms of the, the handling of uh, all those payment processes. The last point here, uh, that, well, it's not entirely accurate. There, um, depending on the value, there may be a competitive bid required, but generally speaking, the bid limit is 25,000 when utilizing strategic contracts. So if you're buying from one of our uh, university contracts, um, you may not need to do a competitive bid until we get to a little bit higher level. Uh, there's there's some some nuance there depending on what we're doing and how what the funding is those sorts of things, but uh, they do they do facilitate an easier process. Uh, I did get a question. I, I think this relates to the earlier unit level contracts. What is the expected turnaround time to review or sign these procurement contracts? Uh, it really varies depending on, on the complexity. Um, anywhere from a few weeks to a number of months, depending on, uh, again, what types of data and samples are involved, uh, how many red lines the supplier wants to do, um, those sorts of things. Um, so so plan, plan that it's likely going to take a while, um, just, just to be realistic, because uh, there, there's a, a lot of moving pieces. Uh, and then is there expertise in procurement about handling terms of samples for sample integrity? Uh, yes, we have experience in, uh, in agreements with suppliers for handling samples. And not, well, not only suppliers, but also collaborators. Uh, the research team in particular uh, can help with that. Um, so if you have any specific concerns, you can email procurement.research. Any other questions on contracts for the moment? Oh, I should mention for the strategic contracts, um, we determine what suppliers to engage with based on our spend and based on the need that we see from the community. Um, so if, if, you're, uh, if you work with a supplier regularly and you think that the university as a whole has a lot of spend with them, uh, certainly you're welcome to reach out to one of the buying teams and bring that to our attention. And we'll take a look at the, the volume, both in terms of money and in terms of number of transactions and see if they would be a good fit for us to establish a university-wide contract with them. Uh, we got a question, what is the best way to get the contracts to procurement? Uh, email or is there an intake form? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so we are actually in the process of implementing uh, a new ticketing system that will include some intake forms to make sure we get all the basic information and there's there's less back and forth uh, and we can really just get right to work on on some of this stuff um, so look for those rolling out in the very near future um, if you contact procurement.services they may at, funnel you through one of these intake forms 
and we expect to uh, uh, expand the use of those in the future. Uh, but for now, either email or uh, the intake form will be fine. Um, any other questions on contracts? So I should go back. Okay. And again, if you have any more questions, we'll have a little bit of time at the end. Uh, let's take a, a quick look at our procurement website and just point out a couple of uh, points of interest. This is our homepage. Um, the featured item here is a link to see our strategic suppliers. We'll click on that in just a moment. And a couple of other things. Um, any kind of news in our newsletter is always available here. A link to market site incur for your travel and expense, uh, and then the copy mail services. Let's start by taking a look at our link to find strategic suppliers. Point you to our search page. There's a lot of good information here. Uh, you can you can actually get a list of all of them or search by um, the commodity or, or type of service. Let's take a look at uh, one. We'll look at Fisher Scientific. It's one of our biggest. So it brings you a number of drop downs with some good information. Um, some of these suppliers have different guidelines on how to interact with them. Uh, you know, Fisher Scientific may require a different interaction than one of our catering suppliers or one of our IT temp staffing suppliers. So there's some good information there. Uh, ordering information can be very helpful. Some of our suppliers allow you to order by short code, uh, and you can call them or email them. Uh, there would be notes here like cards are not accepted. Um, not all of them accept short codes, so you could find that information here. Uh, the other, uh, some information about their shipping charges. This one's important, supplier contacts. Uh, Fisher has a, a lot of sales reps on campus, so you can find all those there. Or contact their, Fisher actually has a, has a dedicated customer service team specific to the university. And finally, if you're having an issue with one of our strategic suppliers and you need procurement help, you can always contact the uh, procurement contacts listed for that supplier. Um, out on the site, we have listed not only our strategic suppliers, but some of our internal service providers as well, uh, and in some consortium agreements. So um, when you're looking for suppliers to help fill a need, uh, take a look at that page and might be able to find some valuable resources. Uh, let's see. Let's also take a look at available training. So here's a link to that quick start guide I mentioned earlier. That would be a valuable resource for you to check out afterwards. Um, there's also some links to the various courses that you may need to get started in processing uh, purchase orders. Uh, there's training for market site. We do have uh, supplier shows on occasion, uh, not so much since the pandemic, but I'm sure we'll get back to those. Uh, and then also some information about our quote to order system. Let's take a quick look at how to contact us if you need something. We'll go to the About Us tab and Contacts. You can see our, our basic phone numbers and whatnot the general procurement email. Uh, and if you email them, they will uh, route your request to the appropriate buying team and find the person best suited to help you. So if you're not sure where to go, start there and they can help you out. From there, you'll see the listings for all the various teams. Uh, this one's my team, so you'll see all of our uh, names and emails and phone numbers listed. Or in general, it's probably more effective to email the group. Uh, so that if someone is out of the office or otherwise unavailable, uh, another team member can pick up that inquiry. You can see we have a, a number of different teams. The buying teams are primarily the, the research team, facilities, print and professional, technology, and general goods and services. But we also have some ancillary departments, uh, property disposition, property control, space analysis, and print copy and mail. And again, if you're not sure where to start, Start with procurement services, 
and they can help triage your request to the appropriate place. And then one other page that I'll direct you to that has some good information, uh, the, our forms page. So there's some, some good items here about uh, using the P card, uh, travel and expense, those sorts of things. Um, the big one here uh, is pro for most of you is probably going to be the sole source justification form. I would encourage you to uh, uh, bookmark this link. Uh, some people save a copy of the form to their desktop, but we do change it on occasion. Um, and so it's best to keep a link to the most recent uh, version. Actually, a great example of that that I didn't think about when we talked about sole sources, there used to be a question on there asking if the item being purchased was named in the awarded grant. Uh, that used to be a valid reason for a sole source, but with the updated uniform guidance, um, I should mention that just because it's listed in an awarded grant does not exempt it from the competitive bid process. There's a question for LSNA, should we always go through LSA procurement first? Yes. So in general, for uh, everyone, you you all have um, unit purchasing staff or someone in your unit that is the primary uh, uh, purchasing contact for all your labs. You should go to them first and often they will interact with central procurement. And if we need to reach out to PIs or lab staff, uh, we will do that but your first stop should be with your department purchasing personnel. Uh, let's see. We had a question about regental action requests for transactions. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure we can talk about that more offline, but uh, a region's action request is typically used when uh, we have a conflict of interest supplier. Um, so I, sh I should mention if you're, Trying to transact with a supplier uh, that has a conflict of interest with the university, those can take uh, literally months. Um, there's a, a, a multi-step approval process that starts with the procurement agent uh, and goes all the way up through the you know vice president, chief financial officer, and then eventually to the regents. And the regents don't meet every month, uh, but it, it's state law that the regents have to approve every COI transaction. So expect those to take uh, quite a while. And part of that is a region's action request. Um, let's see, I think that was Kathleen. If you could uh, send me an email afterward and we can we can talk offline about uh, anything more about the RAR process. Jim, yep. there was one earlier one from Meredith. If we have a major problem with the supplier, does procurement want to hear about it? And I don't know if that means a supplier that's not a strategic supplier. Sure, so we are happy to help in any way we can. If you're in a major dispute with the supplier, uh, feel free to contact us. If we can help, we will. Sometimes uh, when a supplier hears from, you know, the University Central Procurement Office that can lend a little more weight to the discussion, um, not always, but. We're happy to help out in, in any way we can. Certainly, if it's one of our strategics, uh, we definitely want to hear about that. But even, even if it's not a strategic, um, we'll do what we can. All right. I'll head back to the website. Or I'm sorry, to the slide deck. So again, a couple of useful links. Um, link to our website. Uh, I would encourage you all to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, if you need to contact procurement, uh, you've got a phone number and uh, email address there. So I'll just link to some training resources. So any other questions? If we want to use a specific consultant that is a specialist in the research area. Uh, so the question is, if we want to use a specific consultant that is a specialist in the research area, and we've used them in the past, will that help on our sole source request or not? Yes. Uh, if you can provide uh, maybe a, a CV or a resume for them or something that shows that they're an expert in that particular area, or yeah, if you've used them in the past uh, and, and established um, you know, data or research based on that, uh, that would be good information for the sole source. 
Uh, Chrissy asks, uh, if we can talk a little bit more about the competitive bidding process for strategic suppliers on um, purchases over 25K, when is it necessary? Um, there are a number of different scenarios and part of that is dependent on the funding mechanism and what we're buying. Um, for example, if we're buying uh, a slew of uh, minus 80 freezers, that's a very common thing that we can get from a number of suppliers, we would push to competitively bid that. Uh, but there are also times when we're doing some lab startups where we might look to uh, Fisher or VWR, one of those to provide sort of a startup package. Um, it's really, really on a case by case basis. Uh, so contract uh, a procurement agent and we can, we can walk through that with you. Uh, so I'm looking at uh, Dana's question. If capital equipment has already been purchased for uh, a, a clinical site on a grant and now we're getting a, a new grant to continue that research and it looks like we want to buy more equipment or replacement equipment. Um, if we're, if, if, we're met, if, if the research is the same and we're continuing that same vein of research, even if the funding has changed and we need to match the data that's been previously established or it has to be comparable, uh, that could be a valid reason for a sole source. Um, you could also talk about uh, staff have already been trained on the use of this you know, specific piece of equipment and it has certain technical capabilities uh, critical to our research. Um, so those would be reasons for a sole source. Well, if you think of any uh, additional questions, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm happy to help with anything. And uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Have a good day, everyone.